brief 30 minutes that I have, I was asked to talk about three aspects of strategy. Strategy formulation, strategic transformation, and strategy execution. So this is going to be a bit of a, uh, a quick, breathless uh, talk. So what is strategy about? Well, obviously, strategy is about competition, competing. Now, when you look at this, you may say, well, lions and tigers don't compete because they don't occupy the same territory. Uh, that's what Nokia said when Apple brought out its iPhone. Another alternative in strategy is that you could cooperate, as this uh, Egyptian plover bird does, picking decaying bits of flesh from the crocodile. What's the business analogy? This is participating in somebody else's business platform, such as um, in Google's platform or Microsoft's platform. Just be very careful that the platform operator doesn't close its mouth quickly on you. Um, strategy also means that sometimes you may face you know, lethal uh, a lethal threat. You may die. Or perhaps not. <laughs> the rabbit is perhaps Chrysler, which could not be killed off despite Daimler doing its best to do so after acquiring it, and in fact destroying more value than the total amount of money that it paid for Chrysler. Or it could be Dyson, which when it first started with its uh, bagless vacuums, you know, Hoover the giant thought it would just eat it up, but now Dyson's far more successful than Hoover, and in fact the human resources uh, director of uh, Dyson is in the audience amongst us. So, you know, on this note of a changing world, we all know that uh, previously successful companies have collapsed. So, clearly, both BlackBerry sold now last week for 5% of its previous peak value of uh, $80 billion, sold for about $5 billion. A Nokia out of making mobile phones altogether. Uh, RBS, perhaps a bit too painful for a British, mostly British audience to hear about. But the interesting story from a HR point of view is General Motors. This was a 40-year car crash. You, know, you could see this coming for 40 years. And I won't go into the... And a bit later on, I'll perhaps talk a bit about how you can you have an inertia where you can crash for 40 years and not see it coming. Uh, one simple reason was that the directors of General Motors never drove the same cars as their customers. Why was that different? Because every day when they drove it into the company garage in Detroit, it would be serviced. So their cars were always in perfect working condition. So whenever people said, you know, America, your General Motors cars are not reliable compared to the Japanese, they said, what do you mean? My car is perfect. So make sure that your executives do not have a separate experience from those of your customers. Of course, we must also talk about globalization. So how do we develop strategy for today's world? And what does this represent? What does this map represent? What is it proportional to? Quick answer. GDP. And in fact, it's already out of date because China's GDP, the green one, is so big. Whenever I look at the US one, I always think, this looks like a giant balloon ready for a pin to be burst in there. <laughs> look how important Europe still is. Uh, I worked in the Netherlands for a while. Netherlands is bigger than most of sub-Saharan sub Africa. But this is the world of today. What about preparing strategy for the world of tomorrow? And clearly, what is this proportional to? Population. So we're going to move in that direction. And this, of course, is huge human resources implications. Are your companies set up for this world of tomorrow? Um, is your talent pool, is your board of directors reflective of this percentage? Of course, they're not. All right. I'd love to hear from anyone in this room who says their talent pool, their board of directors, is proportionally representative to this particular map. All right. And as we're looking at maps, and interesting that uh, Africa still has a lot of pink bits. You remember when uh, half of the African map was pink, showing the color of the British Empire? Well, I'm afraid that Africa is now going from pink to red. China is way ahead of everybody else. Chinese companies are way ahead of everybody else now in the new Africa. And of course, Africa is finally taking off. Um, as the saying goes now, Africa is hot. And you know what was the killer app for Africa? What has been the killer app in the last 10 years for the growth of the African economy? The mobile phone. Right? At a stroke, eliminating the infrastructure problems of Africa. And the simplest example, you know, the farmer who can now phone ahead instead of traveling half a day to the local market can phone ahead to find out which is the best market to take his or her produce to. And now we're getting uh, mobile payments. Again, uh, another killer app to help them. So speaking of China, which is the Chinese company that is the most feared by the West? Somebody whispered Samsung, that's Korean. It is, it is Huawei, and this was the cover 
story of The Economist in August last year. Huawei, the telecoms company, the US won't allow it to get contracts in the US, or certainly not government contracts, because they're afraid that they'll use the phones to spy into uh, various US networks. Uh, Europe is a bit more relaxed about this, but this is a very powerful company in telecoms, telecommunications equipment, investing a huge amount in innovation. And by the way, I'm running a center on innovation in China, so China is moving from imitation to innovation. So if you were afraid of China when they were imitating, you should be even more afraid now that China is innovating. All right, so just uh, some uh, thoughts to shake you up a bit. Let's turn now to something more conceptual. Why does strategy matter? And I'll go on also to define strategy. But for me, strategy matters because effective strategy gets you better performance with fewer resources. Of course, the whole point of business is to get performance, financial performance. And we are always limited in resources, financial resources, people resources. So a better strategy, a more effective strategy, a cleverer strategy gets you better performance. You can think of it as an input-output ratio. You can always do it the dumb way, which is you throw more money at the problem. You can also do it the smart way by having a smart strategy that may avoid head-on competition uh, and some other way in which you get superior performance that way. We also all know that Strategy is extremely difficult both to formulate and particularly to implement and to execute. Why is strategy so difficult? And again, this is a very relevant point for human resource directors. If managers were going to do it anyway, you would not need a strategy. So strategy is about getting the organization to do something new, an unnatural act, change. And that's why we always have this problem of getting people to embrace a new strategy. And this is why General Motors took 40 years to wake up to, say, the simple strategy of shifting to fuel-efficient cars. Right? Very hard. It was, against their, it was against their DNA to do this uh, naturally. And again, what is strategy? Have you ever heard someone, your company or somewhere else, saying, our strategy is to be number one? Anybody heard that? Is that a strategy? It is not a strategy. What is it? It's a strategic objective. Nor is it a business model. In fact, a lot of the previous writing on strategy has had us confused. They confuse a business model, which is static, how we are configured to make money to operate. And even Michael Porter, who was actually my doctoral advisor, I think fell into this trap of a lot of what he calls strategy is actually a static business model linked to a strategic objective such as being number one in the market. What has often been missing are the strategic moves to get you from this business model to the strategic objective. Right? So when someone says our strategic objective has been, our strategy is number one, that's not good enough. What are the moves you're going to make to get there? So a complete strategy combines these three elements of a strategic objective um, based on the business model and the strategic moves. Now, some strategic objectives you know, can be very clear, and it's very nice if you have a very clear objective that is memorable, motivational, and memorable. My favorite example is just coming up. When Toyota launched the Lexus division, their strategic objective was to build a car that could compete with Mercedes, BMW, the luxury brands, the very best in the world. And they put up a slogan in every factory and design room, two words in English, Beat Benz. <laughs> memorable, motivational, measurable, and they succeeded. Furthermore, they were able to do something that General Motors and Ford would have loved to do, and I don't even dare mention British Leyland, um, but they were not capable of doing it. They were capable of doing it. They spent 10 years investing to launch the Lexus, and Nissan did the same with the Infiniti division. Clear objectives help having a clear enemy also helps. Who is this enemy? From the most, the greatest television commercial ever created, popularly voted the best TV commercial ever created. Having a clear enemy helps when you are a challenger. This is from the same TV commercial. Which TV commercial is this? And who is the enemy? IBM is the enemy. Apple, Apple is the challenger. And what was the TV commercial for? The Mac launch, announcing the launch of the Macintosh, January 1984, and the voiceover said, 
and the reason why 1984 won't be like 1984. Right, so this was, IBM was big brother. Apple has been always very good at having an enemy. It was IBM, now IBM has fallen by the wayside, the new enemy is uh, Microsoft, and probably the next enemy is Google and uh, Android. So setting up the company emotionally to execute strategy makes a big difference. I actually came across uh, one CEO who referred to himself not as the chief executive, but as the chief emotional officer of the company. Perhaps you as the HR directors, you can be the chief emotional officer. All right, let's go back to something more conceptual again. And there's a very nice framework from an article last year in Harvard Business Review that says there's you know, more than one style for formulating strategy. In the bottom left-hand box is what we call classical strategy, such as oil companies have. The environment is, has got high predictability, except you know, for a few shocks that you might get now and then. And it's low malleability, which is you can't change the environment very much. So you have this sort of classic Michael Porter type strategy that oil companies, auto companies might have. 